six broken bones and I ended up having about like five surgeries. I didn't realize how serious it was. Instagram, other platforms, like them, hate them. <gasps> Has that come off the back of NFT success? What if it's not received well or something? Where do I go from here? In this episode of The Mood Podcast, I sat down with Gabriella Morton. Now, like some of our guests, Ella took a little persuading to come onto the show, but I'm so glad she agreed to sit down in front of the cameras and the microphone with me. It was worth it. And this is why I enjoy doing this podcast so much. It allows us to dive into the minds of people in the creative space that we might not be able to access normally through other means. Furthermore, it allows discourse around the topics and industry that we love, as well as tapping into the why behind some of our favorite and most inspirational artists out there. So please, if you can find it in your heart to hit the like and subscribe buttons, whichever platform you're watching or listening on, I'd be forever grateful. This will not only allow me to continue bringing you these podcasts, but will also give me more opportunities to attract big guests from around the world onto the show. Now, Ella's story is a fascinating one and something different to most others out there. Her photography is inquisitive, introspective, and often surreal. Her approach has evolved over a decade of exploration through human experience and circumstance, and she manipulates her imagination and conceptualization into powerful and meaningful artwork that inspires many others, as well as the more philanthropic receivers of her work. So please enjoy, and I hope you're as inspired as much as I was. Do you do much video stuff? Um, video I went stuff? I went through a period where I was doing like a fair bit, um, but mainly kind of like assisting in other groups and like I've got a pretty big interest in documentary. Um, and I worked on a documentary for about three years, uh, like prior to COVID. Um, but it wasn't like a full-time thing. It was more just kind of like on the side. Behind the camera. As yes, well always behind always the camera. Behind. Always behind the camera. But sometimes um, you said you fill in for like test shots. Oh, no, you know, just if you're like when you're testing the settings yeah, for yeah, someone yeah, yeah. and you're like just making sure the focus yeah. is all right or like the positioning of the seat or like the microphone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that whole process, I kind of flashing back to that whole process just through the like <laughs> audio stuff here. <laughs> oh, my God, audio. Well, you're not a test subject today. You are you are our guest, so it's, yes. it's a total pleasure to have you. Um, I know we've been trying to capture the best time and, uh, I guess, willingness on your part. I know you're a little bit apprehensive to, yeah, to be I on know. the show, but I know you're um, lucky you got me. <laughs> no, I know it's an absolute privilege. So thank you for thank you for coming. Tell us who you've got on your lap. Well, this is little Tui, and I don't know if she's going to be a nuisance, so we'll see how she goes, but. Um, I believe I owe it to you and Fee to have have her bring so many smiles into my life. <laughs> yeah, not so much Fee, much more Fee. Not so much me, much more Fee. <laughs> not so much Fee, much more me. Uh, no, um, yeah, I haven't seen her. So yeah, Fee, my wife, rescued her from the streets, which is becoming a bit of commonplace here yeah. in Bali. <laughs> um, we have another one who's in Bordy at the moment getting ready, so we'll probably have her in a in our house at some point but i wonder if she'll um, make it onto the podcast we'll just yeah just put her in a seat and see what she says <laughs> <laughs> um tell us a little bit about i mean obviously no limited uh, amount about you we've only met once and that was over a beer very briefly with finn back yeah. in i think it was sometime last year yeah but i've been following you since and obviously absolutely in love with all of your artwork can you tell us like a bit of a an inception story about where where it came from and how it got to kind of who you are as a as an artist today? Yeah, do you have like two years? <laughs> <laughs> um, Take as long as you need. Yeah, well, I've got um, family in the film industry, so cameras have always been like oh, a okay. big part of my life, um, which I feel very privileged about. Um, just kind of always had that knowledge and like the gear and the questions and everything. It's always been there for me. Um, but although it's kind of all I've ever done, there's always been something camera orientated. Um, it's definitely been like quite a diverse journey because I've tried everything from like products to events to tourism to you know I've kind of tried 
the whole mixed bag and now kind of landed somewhere conceptually in the middle of I, I don't even know like what I can label that now like has it become creative direction or like is it still photography I'm not too sure um but it's always been to do with cameras and kind of progressively gone more into like nature and outdoors um rather than like commercial stuff yeah because if you look at your if anyone looks at your work which I I hope they they do um it looks like a you kind of intermingle commercial work with almost um, sur surrealism. A bit yeah, of, totally. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you picked up on the surrealism. That I take that as a compliment. Well, I, that's because I love sur surrealism. Yeah. Absolutely love it. Um, and I think it, it wasn't always like that. Like, I think it definitely started more like documentative and then obviously like a lot of work through tourism and like outdoors. But um yeah, I, I don't really, I, I couldn't say in a couple sentences how I ended up there, but it's just like a progression of a whole sequence of events and then you just kind of end yeah. up where you are. <laughs> that's, that's um, it's a great thing to have a journey to get to where you are. And I, I don't know whether, it's interesting, one, one of the first kind of things I was told as from a mentoring photography individual was um work on your elevator pitch like oh my god you know like, and I, i'm not sure if i agree with that anymore i mean i'm so intimidated by that that's you, probably like my least favorite question I didn't in ask the you. entire world <laughs> i'm not asking you but i the principle of having yeah. an elevator pitch i i mean i don't know whether that's a good thing to have or not as a photographer because suddenly you're now boxing yeah, yourself in no, almost no exactly that's yeah. that's exactly how i find it because i think i've got like quite a diverse set of skills and if i have to just like condense that into 30 seconds i'm like which self am i presenting today like right. who am i <laughs> um so i yeah i should get better at it though i know that like why i don't know probably just from like a business standpoint it's okay. not very good to um not be able to like present yourself in a in a small little elevator yeah. I don't think I'd be very good at that, but at the same time, um, I guess that's not really where my interests are lying Absolutely. either. So yeah. it, it hasn't been a problem yet. <laughs> well, talk to us about that. Like where where do you fit in kind of the commercial side of photography and you know, how do you make money essentially as a as a photographer? Yeah, for sure. So um I would say maybe in like twenty eighteen or so. Um, I started doing like a lot of volunteer work with my photography. I think I was I was searching for something more than, you know, just pretty pictures. And, um, you know, that started with like even like photographing puppies to help them get adopted. Or um, I did like a work on a documentary called Project Blue, which we were filming yep, for about that. three years. Um, and I yeah helped other friends with documentaries on like social work and I think I was always looking for something more meaningful than yeah like just something being aesthetic or something being pretty and it, yeah after working on those things through like volunteer work um, I started realizing like the power of vocation through like visuals um, and that a lot of people are visual learners and don't necessarily like digest things in terms of like reading a book. Um, and so for me personally, like if I wanted to ever digest anything that was like scientific, I always liked watching like real graphic like YouTube videos and um, yeah, love documentary. That's just how I like to consume my facts. Um, and so I kind of tried to tie that in with my photography for a little bit. And when I was finding clients, I was like, how could I, you know, it's like trying to find your icky guy or whatever. It's like your vocation and what you're good at and what you love and what can essentially make you money. And it was always kind of the money part of the puzzle that was missing. Um, but eventually, I mean, I stuck to it for so many years and I kind of got known for doing like a lot of sustainable products and whether that was like through fashion or um, cosmetics or uh yeah like a whole bunch of things really but um it was quite nice when people started to like approach me because they knew that like that was my voice rather than me having to like cold pitch all these random people who I didn't align with and so it didn't happen overnight but I think eventually 
because I stuck to my my voice in that sense. I did become recognised for that and the rest kind of just follows suit. I think that's absolutely key for anyone watching or listening, learning where they fit in as as a photographer, mm. as an artist or whatever your vocation is, is to find that voice. And however long it takes, I think that's, I don't know if you agree, but it's a such an imperative to have a voice as an artist, whatever form of art that might be, because then it's not an identity, but it's a purposeful meaning yeah. to, to what you do, which then other people can identify with. Exactly. Right? So it's different. And it's so, yeah, I feel like everyone always tells you like, oh, you need a voice. Like, what's your story? What's this? What's that? Um, but it doesn't happen overnight. You kind of do stumble into it and you go through phases of trial and error and you try things out and they don't always work that well. Like I've tried so many different styles of photography and just apps that like wedding photography is not my jam trying to like direct a whole crowd of drunk people is just like not where my skills lie. <laughs> um, but yeah, like eventually you do stumble into something and I think you just have to be open to like trying new things. So how long was that process for you to, uh, well, first of all, when did you pick up when, I know you grew up with it, but when mm. did you really start Yeah. kind of doing this seriously? Um, it's such a hard question. I get asked that all the time, but like I did always have cameras in my life from like a very young age, like disposable cameras that I didn't even know how to use and yeah. just had lots of fun with. Um, but I would say probably when I had like a real interest myself in terms of like having my own direction with it um, was like when Tumblr was a big thing when I was a teenager. So I don't know how old I would have been, must have been like 15 or something like that. Um, and just like, you know, going out with friends like in the streets doing like really cringe urban <laughs> shoots. And like, I look back and I just think it's so funny, but like, it, it's just one of the phases that you go through to kind of develop things. And it's so far from where I am now. Um, but after that, yeah, it would have been like, then there was like the rise of Instagram and me and my partner Ash were going camping like every single weekend because we were trying to save money to go up to Europe and we didn't want to go so, out. So you were in New Zealand at this time? Where were you? Oh yeah. So yeah, New Zealand this whole time. So okay. I grew up in New Zealand. Um, and yeah, this must have been, yeah, by the time I was about 18 and like Instagram was like kind of like becoming a cool thing and um yeah, we were going camping every weekend and yeah, I started taking the camera like outdoors and I never really like been in the natural world like to that extent or that remotely before. And like I hadn't really seen the stars or the Milky Way to that extent. And then I just kind of fell in love with the natural world from there. Um, but yeah, then again, I feel like I've had so many metamorphoses since then. <laughs> Tell us more. Oh. <sighs> Um, yeah, what's the next one? Uh, metamorphoses. So where, where, at what point did you think, oh, okay, I'm, this is me. This is what, this is, this is the genre. This is style. This is where I can craft a voice. This um, is... I, th I think I've felt that many times. Okay. Like it's happened so many times where I'm like, this is me. And then I've shape shifted again. Um, but I think like right now I'm really happy with where I am. Um, other than. Yeah, I think I want to kind of circle back to like more of a vocation with my work because I think that that was something that I ended up losing um, probably like two years ago. Um, and I had, it was obviously like we had COVID and I was recovering from some injuries and I think my work became like a lot more introspective and on some levels like maybe a bit more selfish um, than the previous work that I was doing. Um, like with other people and like trying to have like a a message that was I don't know beyond like something that was beyond or greater than myself um, so I think that's something like I want to like circle back towards so can, would you mind talking a little bit more about your injuries and, and what actually happened there because I think yeah. sometimes big life events will reshape a way of thinking I mean i take COVID it was an externality but it changed many people's lives for the better or the worse and yeah um you know I'm sure if something happens to you very personally and very drastically and seriously that's got to alter 
your mind, right? The way Absolutely. you think, the way you perceive, the way you want to yeah. do things. Can you share with us kind of yeah, what definitely. happened? Yeah, um, definitely. I think, yeah, very defining moments. Like, obviously, there's a whole spectrum of things that that could define that. But, um, yeah, in this case, I was on a photo shoot with one of my closest friends and we went on a road trip down like two, three hours uh, away from our hometown in Auckland. And it was the middle of the day, uh, completely fine conditions. Like you wouldn't think there would be any sort of road accident, but someone had fallen asleep behind the wheel um, and they just kind of crossed the center line and we just see it coming towards us. And we're like, yo, like, are they going to stop? Could see it coming towards us for 15 seconds. Um, oh my God. Oh, actually, that's probably an exaggeration. It was probably like seven seconds, but it felt like eternity. Like we could just see it coming towards us, but there was nothing like we could do because there was like a cliff on one side and then oncoming traffic on the next. So like, what? <laughs> you, you, all hell. you can do is slow down and just like prepare to like brace yourself. So we did what we could um, and we got off really luckily, uh, but he was still coming at like, 80 kilometers per hour and it was like a big ute with a trailer um and just so many things wrong with the situation but i guess driver's fatigue is like a whole issue in itself uh-huh. he was fine okay um his passenger got injured i think like a broken ankle um but yeah it was kind of the cars ended up clipping passenger to passenger um so both the drivers were okay um and yet both the passengers got injured and i was definitely the worst so you were the passenger yes i was like front front right oh front left seat passenger because that's how the cars are orientated back home but um yeah i ended up with six broken bones and i ended up having about like five surgeries um like undergoing like nerve damage pains was in a wheelchair for a couple months oh my goodness. Um, bunch of time in hospital years in therapy like um learning how to like use my grip again so what were your injuries specifically uh so i broke my ulna like in three places so that's got like a massive scar i right noticed there. that earlier, yeah that's... um and so i broke that very severely so the bone just kind of came right out of the skin it was very very graphic um and then my little finger was like bent all the way backwards because pretty much what had happened was the the door of the car just like encaved over my arm so I was trapped in there for two hours and had to get like cut out by the uh like the fire trucks like pretty much the whole rescue team was there there was like helicopters ambulance fire trucks police like the whole road it was like absolute carnage the scene but um just so lucky that uh my brain my yeah my brain my spinal cord my pelvis my organs like all those things were miraculously fine um so that's that's nice. I I try and focus on the positive. Yeah. Oh well. Oh, good and for you. the other injuries. Yeah, I had like nerve damage up my legs, which I still have today. But like it, it doesn't really matter, and it gets better in time. And then um, uh, my foot. I think I broke four bones in my foot. So that was like very crushed and like such small niggly little bones that are. Yeah, but painful. Very painful. Um, and at the time, like, I, I couldn't move. Like, I did feel like I was paralyzed. Like, and we didn't know until I got to the hospital, like, what it was. It was a very scary time in the ER. Can room. you remember the accident? And Yeah, all of it? so I didn't, I don't know how, but, like, I wasn't knocked out at all. I remember everything in, like, horrific detail. Um, like, the airbags, the, fe- like, the sensation. Wow. Like, it's very claustrophobic feeling, and it's, like... It's like deep heat. There's just like fire like all over your body. Um, and then the adrenaline kicks in and you feel super wired. Um, and like people are asking me questions if I'm okay. And I'm just like chatting to them like I'm on drugs or something. Yeah. I wasn't. Like I hadn't. Just adrenaline. Yeah, just the adrenaline like fully takes over in, in a really nice way um, because it was pretty freaky and pretty confronting, I think, for like everyone else who was witnessing the situation feel like you you play it down a lot and you're very very <laughs> humble about it and, but i'm sure um you know you're probably very bored of telling that so you must have been asked a million times but um the the thing i for, before we <laughs> move on to more photography stuff yeah um 
I'm I'm such a wuss when it comes to pain. Like if yeah. I bang my shin and just a little bit Ooh, on like a like the funny I'm bang. like it's the worst thing that's ever happened yeah. to me. Like I, yeah. my morning or my like a couple of that fees laughing because she knows like oh. <laughs> and then I'm done. I can't. My biggest fear in life is pain. Yeah. I don't fear death. Yeah. I don't fear a lot of things. But just pain. Like every my whole life is to avoid pain. Have you ever had that thought where it's like? Um, you know, like mind over matter, what if pain is like purely subjective, like in our and head. I, and I've read enough and um, listened enough to professionals to know that that is, that is true or to, to a yeah, large part. Is it? I don't know. I just. Because, you know, that that's, you know, we take um, something like uh, meditation, like a practice that, yeah. that is, that has many benefits and it's kind of a trend these days, but you know, it's been around for hundreds of years. The, the whole idea of that really is to um, to process, suffer, to either avoid suffering or process suffering in a way that you can deal with it. That's not mm. overwhelming, that's not damaging to others, that you can actually still be happy whether bad things or good things are happening to you. Right. So that, that goes with emotional pain as much as physical pain. Yeah. So I'm, obs- I'm not obsessed, but I'm very, very interested in... in, in um, I've been meditating for a while and I still have never got to that point where if I'm in pain physically, mm. being able to accept that, absorb it and kind of dissolve it at some point. Yeah. I still believe like that the right side of my brain is going, well, if you've broken your arm, it's just fucking hurts. There's no, there's no yeah. arm about it. It's just fucking hurts. Yeah. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it, that, this mind over matter cliche is is yeah is true but i i picture you i don't want to bring the vision up again but if you're in a car accident a very very serious one mm. it's gonna hurt like yeah of there's course. adrenaline but at some point that adrenaline is gonna wear yeah. off if you've got bones sticking out yeah and so i guess it kind of ties back into the like mind over matter thing when you don't actually know or you can't see what has happened mm. so yeah like i said like the initial sensation was like very claustrophobic and I always if I'm trying to describe it I always say like it felt like there was an elephant like standing on top of me like I was crushed and like weighed down by the because like the metal was like encaved over you so the dashboard was like on my lap and the the metal of the door where the impact was was like encaved over my arm so like I only had my right hand free and I actually had my phone in my hand like because I'd just gotten off the phone to Ash like two minutes earlier it was like super surreal um and he was very confused when he got the call like three minutes later that something had happened but anyway um I couldn't actually see what had happened so yeah there was like an overall sensation through my body but in my head I was still thinking like oh this is like really inconvenient but like in my head I kind of just assumed I'd like be going back to Auckland later that night or the next morning. Like I didn't realize how serious it was. I knew I was in pain, but I couldn't see that like my bones were coming out. I couldn't see that my finger was like a curly fry. (laughs) Um, And yeah, I don't know. You're just, you're in such a different state with the adrenaline. Uh, yeah. But then, yeah, by the time they like started cutting me out and I started seeing how bad things really were, yeah, it sinks in and you you freak out a lot more once wow. you see what's happened. Um, but it, yeah, interesting exercise in terms of pain. Like it, it wasn't not painful, but I think it makes it worse when you can actually see it. Yeah, and I've seen a lot up close. I used to play a lot of sport and and had injuries myself. Nothing yeah. that graphic or serious, but broken bones and yeah, they hurt and you get on with it but when you see something you know i've had a lot of friends or i've been on a rugby pitch or something yeah. and you see a leg that's when it's wonky right. or like dislocated <sighs> that and is the, the worst they are and they see it and they are then like screaming like a fucking five-year-old right it's I, like yeah they're in so much pain yeah i look at them and just go i never want to experience that it's ever. so wheezy feeling yeah um and I'm glad that I couldn't see what had happened for like the most part. But um, event, I don't know, eventually I was kind of looking at it like, yeah, just in a very surreal way. Like this isn't real. Like this is not happening yeah. right now. Like yeah. someone pinch me, but yeah. 
just so alert and so wired the whole time. It's crazy, like the chemicals that your body oh, starts sure. releasing. And then, yeah, they come in and they start pumping you with other stuff and then you can't really tell what what's what anymore. And from there, everything was quite, um, what's it called? Like they've covered everything up. So you, you don't feel much after that. Everything's hidden and you, yeah. Yeah, you can't really. Yeah. Interesting. So move into i guess any um mental damage that might have been done mm. or emotional damage um was there any or did it just kind of just flick a switch and go oh, okay maybe i'm looking at, maybe now i look at life a little bit differently yeah i think uh from the most part like i think it was really good character building and like um not that I would like wish that experience upon myself. Um, I don't like, I don't think it was bad for the things that it like taught me in my own, in my own head. Yeah. Um, but I always looked at it like really positive because I had such a supportive family and like network of friends. Um, and when they kind of show up for you, like on your hospital bed, it, it's crazy. It's like, it feels like you died. And like, these are the people coming to your funeral and you like all these people come out of the woodworks that, like you wouldn't expect to and you just feel so extremely loved um that like that was very empowering feeling for me like realizing who i had around me um and yeah just being grateful like i'm so young like it's covid right now we're not really doing anything better anyway it's winter like they always said like you know by summer it'll be okay um it ended up being a lot longer than that but these like little things like really pushed me through um so I think, yeah, keeping that mindset helped a lot. Uh, but in hindsight, um, there were definitely like hurdles that that imposed, like in terms of client work. Like I just found like my vocation and I just kind of come out of um, trying to like pitch for work all the time. Like people were finally coming to me and like knowing me for who I was. And then I couldn't work for two years. Um, so that was very confronting. Um, and I was like, what am I going to do if I can't like do photography? That's all I've ever done. Um, but it gave me the gift of time to start dabbling in digital art and looking at the NFT space and kind of navigating that whole world. Um, which I don't know how far I would have got into if I didn't have, if I wasn't sitting in bed for like a whole year, mm -hmm. I don't really know, like life would probably be quite different. Maybe I would be like doing more stuff in terms of vocation, like maybe getting like super dream clients and stuff, but it would be a very different path that I would have ended up on. And I think both would be good, but I'm happy with where I am now as well. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, but if you go back to what you said um, about it, teach that experience teaching you many things specifically with mm. regards to photography and your direction with it. Yeah. Can you, give us a couple of couple of things that maybe it did teach you or that, that, that you had learned from that so I mean if I were to rephrase it then mm. um how did it change your photography specifically or your style or your voice yeah well and I think this is something I can only answer in hindsight because I didn't really see it happening at the time but um I guess when you go through a situation like that there's a lot of pressure and I don't I don't even think it's necessarily external, but like there was pressure within myself that I kind of had to come back and like reinvent myself somehow. Right. Um, and that was like really daunting for me because I hadn't done any growing. I hadn't like gained any new skills while I was sitting in bed all this time. Um, and I was quite ambitious beforehand. So I'm like, wh where do I go from here? It felt very stunting, like in terms of like, career progression yeah. or whatever you want to call it um but yeah and uh, physically as well right well exactly like yeah holding things and exactly and walking there and was another spanner in the works because um right when i thought i'd healed and we were about to come over to asia i went to go have like my final scan and they were like oh actually the arm is like worse than it was last time we checked and we're going to have to do another bone graft and you're going to have to like start this whole process from scratch. And I was like, oh my God. What? But, and I was feeling really strong at that point and I actually had like rehabilitated to most of my ability, but I didn't realize like what was going on inside and that I'd have to like have the setback. So 
uh, before I went in for that bone graft, I made sure that I like had some assets, uh, like photographic assets to be able to edit while I was in recovery again. Okay. Cause I was like, Oh, I can't do recovery again with like nothing to do. Um, and I was so excited to get, get back out there and shoot. But yeah, so I had this weird mix of like limited ability, but wanting, like really wanting to have something to do while I was in my next recovery phase. And so I went out into like the forest at the local park and it was literally like a five minute walk from my house, to something very achievable that I could walk down the road and do. And I had such limited gear um, because I couldn't, I wasn't strong enough to like carry my big lenses or my big backpack and like tripod yeah. or any of the stuff that I was used to. So I just had like my little 35 millimeter on my camera and, um, my phone torch and some like random plastic, um, plastic colored covers and like hair ties that I would strap around my phone torch and like shine these lights onto like little mushrooms in the forest and it was so like silly collection. and and little um and I didn't know like what would come of it at the time but I was just kind of using what I had I couldn't go out and like climb a mountain so instead of kind of being obsessed with the vastness or like the epicness of a location I was kind of transforming that into like more intimate settings that like we might otherwise find mundane and like how can you transform the atmosphere of something that you see every day um so yeah I think that really changed my photography a lot because now that's kind of what I've been doing I haven't had to like go and do these huge location scouts um I've just kind of like worked with what I had and like seen the world in a in a different way with the resources Amazing. that are available so almost your circumstances or your limited circumstances yeah. dictated kind of a new vision, I guess, for, for you. Exactly. And I, I guess it's kind of like what people say, like having a tight brief is actually a blessing a lot of the time. Like have it, if someone just say gives you a brief that's like very, very broad, um, like where do you begin? But if, if your circumstances are tight, then it's kind of crazy what you end up coming up mm. with, like within those boundaries. Um so yeah, it kind of taught me not to be afraid of of those limitations and like use them to your advantage and let it draw things out that you otherwise wouldn't really explore. And when you talked earlier about getting to a place before the accident where people would come to you or the clients would come to you, mm. how did you how did you do that? Because you know, I think a lot of budding photographers will quite rightly you go and pitch and work hard to do that there's yeah. the, at some point there's a crossover right or at least a combination of pitching outreaching and people actually you yeah. know, seeking you out what, yeah could you pinpoint any reasons why that happened for you or, or tips that you might be able to offer on that yeah um I would say the crossover was really only just happening for me like within that lot the year uh, leading up to before the accident had happened um, and I was still like going out of my way to like pitch to companies that I thought I personally aligned with but um, yeah I think just kind of being strong and in what like you do want to advocate for and for me it was like um, I'm a big believer in like using your dollar as a vote um, like towards the planet that you actually want to live on and so if I was pitching for brands I was like is this a brand that like is this a brand I would want to spend my money on is this a brand that um I don't know yeah it, it's hard to say because everyone is so different and I was <clears throat> I'm quite like strong-minded and I have like a very strong ethos on like who I align with so I'm quite picky and other people might not be but mm. um I think initially it held me back but um eventually like because I stuck to it for so long like I did become known for that and then yeah I had like a bank reach out to me and they were like hey do you want to like um do some work for our like carbon footprint tracker or something and I'm like that's so random that's something I would never pitch but like cool that you thought of me like I'm honored um and so yeah when that started happening it was very fulfilling but 
that is kind of a distant memory now, unfortunately. Do you find that you're you're um, a bit of a rebel? Do you rebel against like uh, institutions or um, political narratives, or is that how you see yourself? Uh, I would say like. I, I'm very interested in like activism and that kind of thing, yeah. but like I'm not a very political person at all. Um, that kind of stuff intimidates me a lot, but I, I know what I care about and I know that like when you bond with the people um, who care about the same things, they can um, they can like help you get to those places and like fill in the gaps and you can create really cool things when you like bond together with people who have such a strong purpose yeah so the the cause yeah. comes first and then photography afterwards um yeah 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 definitely i think that's a really important lesson for people is is doing not only doing what you love but doing something that means something to you or at least working with other people that share the same purpose right yeah because otherwise you'll end up just this scatter gun approach like oh i'll try a bit of that and then i'll work yeah. with that one and then i'll work with that one and not quite totally. it's really inspiring that you stayed so true to your belief system yeah which in the end is a complete asset to your your skills and your photography because people see through that people people see if you're a bit of a um, opaque human like oh i don't you know does he mean what he says he means or does she, yeah. does she kind of really do this properly or does she normally do that kind of thing and exactly. does she believe in our mission and our message and that shouldn't matter but it does and i think that definitely comes through in the final product as well if you see yeah. an artist that is so passionate about the belief system behind a piece of visual art let's say it comes through and it definitely comes through in the, yeah. in the artwork yeah, exactly. And then on the like counter side of that, which is something that I think I'm still trying to navigate right now is like having such strong beliefs and then uh, like growing through them and like not being afraid to like upgrade those beliefs when like you learn yep. something new and like staying open minded, even when you're like very strong willed in something. Um, and I think probably like a lot of those fears stem from like like cancel culture today it's so aggressive um but yeah i think if you're just kind of open uh open to upgrading those beliefs like it doesn't it doesn't really matter you can change your mind on things absolutely i mean, it's why yeah. we started this podcast actually it's just yeah just to have conversations um you know it's it's great for me because i get to hear other amazing artists and learn from them but hopefully people watching and listening can learn as well but also just as a as a collective the more conversations we have and the more education we're able willing to receive right mm. <clears throat> willing to be wrong willing to maybe go oh actually yeah, i didn't think about it like that yeah and, and that's you... the biggest power in that's the biggest power we have as humans in this world and you as a host like must be going through that all the time because you're chatting to so like such a variety of opinions um and you have to like stay very open-minded to like what what someone's gonna say you don't yeah. know like some random conspiracy someone might have <laughs> and like how you're going to navigate that on the spot um but yeah, yeah it takes like a certain type of person as well i think yeah exactly that's what i was yeah. gonna say like some people just will not some people aren't just that opinionated which is which is great sometimes yeah. because it just makes for sometimes a bit of a boring conversation or mm. that I have to work a little bit harder. Mm. This conversation isn't that, don't worry. Um, but some, some, I am quite like, indecisive. <laughs> some, some guys just want to just, I just want to go and shoot some photos and, um, you know, yeah. I feel I'm pretty good at it and I like what I do. I don't really care about the message, the voice, the, 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 I guess the conceptualization of mm. shoots, how, you know, how to sell it. And they just, some guys just want to go out and shoot and that's cool. Like they're yeah. a bit more, a bit more on the, the, I, I guess like technical photographers, they love, yeah. they love their equipment and they love, you know, doing this. And, and they're so talented at what they do oh, as yeah, well and they enjoy it. And yeah, like, that's not taking anything away from it, it's it's just, great, that's the way but, they. Um, I agree. Like, yeah, sometimes you kind of, I think this is why I found it hard even like, you know, when you, 
get thrown into a, some sort of setting it's like oh you're like you're all photographers like you're all going to be such great friends and it's like well no not necessarily like we've got very like different ideas on like what brings us joy or like what success means to us or uh like what actually fuels the fire yeah. um and so that can be like quite hard to like relate to a lot of people in that sense as well well i think it can be a both beautiful thing and um not so beautiful thing because if mm. if the other person is is dismissive let's say then you know just there's the barrier straight away right if the other person is open to even just and I've, this isn't really one for photographers because we're it's an individual pursuit but if if you go shooting together yeah that's a really really interesting experience yeah um, because some guys will be like this is this is this is my camera this is my yeah. shoot you can't see anything i don't yeah. want to ask me any questions to go with other guys like hey what do you think about this and maybe we can do that or you know what are you totally. seeing that i'm not seeing yeah so it's, re it's a really interesting kind of the dynamic yeah. is yeah. ridiculous and yeah maybe you get along with someone really really well uh yeah. out of the field and then the experience on the field is very different um i think yeah that's definitely something i struggled with um like shooting with photographers initially like especially in kind of like the outdoors scene it's like oh like let's all go like camping together and then like you're getting a shot and then like there's three other people over your shoulder like trying to claim what you've done and yep. I, it's fine and like we still had so much fun but I, I think now like I that's probably why I plan my shoots now and then I can just go out do my shoot done my thing it's it's i don't really mix it so much with the leisure yeah. as much anymore yeah um and it means that when i do go and have the leisure i'm not thinking about work and i'm not thinking about like yeah. oh what angle am i going to get i'm actually enjoying the experience yeah. and like being present yeah um so that's kind of like a nice realization but i think there's you can definitely find a balance of it and some people be way better at it than me like you know people who live their lives on the roads um they've definitely kind of found that sweet spot and that for works sure. for them and that's great. They're sure. living the life. Go yeah. them. Well, maybe it looks like they're living True. the life. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe there's more to it. <laughs> um, yeah, totally agree. I think, yeah, going back to what we are saying, open-minded, open-mindedness is uh, almost, I mean, um, a skill, maybe skill is the wrong word, but something wise people always have. Right is is and wise and happy people always have mm. is that open mindedness and I just think that comes through. You can see it in people's artwork. You can yeah. see artwork that is confined and narrow minded. You can see artwork or artists that are able to absorb many different inspirations, but still yeah. make uniqueness out of it, or yeah. absorb opinions, or absorb conversations and learning exercises and experimentation. So many people are so afraid of experimenting or trying new things. Yeah, because they they've been told their whole life yeah. they have to stick to a niche and yep. like you need to become known for like one style yep. and yeah, it's limiting. Yeah, I did a video on style actually a couple of months ago and um, it was an interesting experiment just just learning what the general consensus is and it's 50-50. It's, it really, is. it's really yeah. special. And I can see both sides of it, but it's it so, depends so entirely on what you're using your photography for. Yeah, right, and where what the intent behind it is, and I think it's um, it's definitely beneficial to like be able to study something so meticulously that you, yeah, like you do grow a specific skill set in that area that's like very specific to you. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and you should you should definitely explore that and dive into it. But yeah. um, I think as long as you're just not like ruling other ideas out as well and like suppressing other things that you might find a lot of interest in too. But a, a question for you is um, something that no, 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 <laughs> something that I'm trying to toss up at the moment is um, when you when you put an artwork out there, um, how do you feel about like giving it? How much context do you like to give it? In what respect? Like if. As in the if story behind it? Yeah, like, do you like people to be able to digest that image without the context of the story first? Or do you like them to read the story alongside? That is a brilliant question. And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, 
yeah. I would love to have for me art is is like beauty it's in the it's in the eye of the beholder mm. so if you were to for me anyway if I look at an image I want to make what I want of that image I don't want it to hit me in the face with exactly what it is yeah I want there to be for me as an artist I want to spark really curiosity yeah so here's my artwork. make of it what you think for me my main genre is like cultural portraiture so they're they're there is an element of a uh, information there, not necessarily a story. Hopefully, there's a story, but it's like environmental, yeah, a bit more of it, like a documentative yeah. type fine art approach. That's kind mm -hmm. of what I enjoy doing the most. And do you think by like people knowing the facts of like where and when and like how relevant that person is makes them enjoy the image I any more or less? The if it's a specific cultural photo, something. Like I, I try and go after the lesser known cultures and just learn about them for myself and hopefully mm -hmm. capture them. If if I can pass on some of that information that's not readily known to other people, then I like that. But if it's mm -hmm. a photo that maybe isn't anything special with regards to the subject or the culture or the, the, the location or whatever, kind of the context that you're talking yeah. about, then I'll let I'll just leave it and let the you know yeah. it's a portrait of this person and make isn't what it you want of it beautiful to like hear people's responses Love it. to that it's like I think that's one of the most like that's the biggest dopamine hit I could get is like hearing someone's response like when they haven't had context or maybe a little bit of context um, especially when it's different to my own um it just it it shows you that like not everyone's brains are gonna like be as receptive or less receptive or more receptive Absolutely. as yours which is the which yeah. is the essence of the beauty of it because yeah because otherwise if everyone thought the same like it was just a homo homogenous set of images that everyone thinks the same about or yeah. set of whatever you know everyone has their own perceptions of no exactly everything and if you can spark that and i think those the best artists do that they can spark mm. that curiosity in in an image that has layers like oh yeah because oh, you want to feel like rewarded when you're looking at something if everything's handed you like on a platter yeah then you don't really feel like you know things always feel better when you've like worked for it for um, sure and so yeah i think that's something that i've only kind of just started realizing in the last few years um probably like having more like introspective time to myself and like digesting other people's artwork and like um what sparks those feelings for me when I'm the observer um because I used to always just like slam like this is what I think about it like this is what it means like you should feel this really? because I feel this but like I've definitely taken a step back from that over the last couple of years interesting. and it's, it's just interesting to like see what other people I've never takes done on that um I I fee my wife is my my litmus test because really when the first person that sees my image is is her mm. and immediately I'll know within a second just by looking at her face what she thinks of the right. image so that's like my first okay if it sparks as long as it doesn't as long as it's not like I don't like that but yeah. if it, oh, you know, sparks a little bit of, ah, oh, I didn't expect that, or that's really nice, or I love the aesthetics, or I love mm -hmm. the expression, or whatever, whatever the image says. Um, that for me is when I know it, and most of the time it's completely different. We're very different people. Yeah. So yeah, I I totally agree. Then I know I've done. That's that dopamine. That's that. Okay, I've done a. Done, I've done my job. Yeah. Whereas if it's just a flat, and that's where social media, I guess, and we'll talk about this at some point is a utility to some respect it's mm -hmm. not it's it's not accurate in terms of, of a reflection of what society thinks social media but at least you you can put something out there and gauge reaction to it subject to algorithms mm -hmm. and platforms and shit like that yeah but you get it you can get an idea right yeah totally do you social media is a thing for you i mean we'll get onto twitter and nfts because i know that's your thing but um Instagram, other platforms, like them, hate them, appreciate <laughs> them, respect them, not what it's, you it's definitely like the whole love hate relationship, yeah. right? Um, and Instagram was like very helpful in terms of like creating. I know I just said niches can be bad things, but like it did uh, help me 
direct my niche into like a audience um and clientele that was like super beneficial for me like during the time like before the pandemic um and I was spending a lot of my time there um and a lot of my work would come from there as well uh which was really nice um but I think ultimately I find the pace very difficult to keep up with yeah. um my process is very slow like I'm only at the moment I'm only releasing like you know maximum like 20 pieces per year um and so if you split that over like a Instagram algorithm post you're, you're well, posting like once every two weeks if you if you're lucky and it, for me it wouldn't even be like that'd be like nothing for like nothing for months and then like okay here's five photos <laughs> um so the the pace I find very difficult um but yeah I, I don't really think about it much to be honest it's just like if I have something to share I'll pop it on if I don't I'll just there'll just be crickets for a long time and that's that <laughs> Why the slow pace of your work? Talk us through your your process. Um, it's so different every time. I guess yeah. Let's but, take your latest um, latest collection. Yeah, so I think a lot of it, like like I said earlier, um, it's usually like the concept comes first. So I always have like some sort of idea that I'm finding hard to express, like verbally, um, or just like express or digest in any sense so I'm always thinking like how can I communicate this feeling um visually instead so it, it'll be many many months of like random broken thoughts that I'm just like collecting uh collecting just like little seeds and like chucking them in my pocket and saving them for later uh, but like also eventually you realize you're collecting all these ideas and it makes it so much harder to walk like you, your pockets are full you're so heavy and like you don't have any mental space to actually like let them flourish or what a great analogy. take action um and so yeah that's something I've been struggling with over the past like two years um is like hoarding the ideas and like which ones should I act on first and um like which ones are gonna have momentum and which ones are gonna fall flat and like if I don't act on it now will I care about it in two weeks time or three weeks time and just kind of letting them brew and see what ones I keep coming back to so you talk to me about that idea specifically if you can like the formulation of that idea up until kind of the conceptualization and then actually shooting I know Many people would love to hear your process. <laughs> and yeah, okay, if we're speaking about that shot yeah. in particular, um, it, it's a very like unique case of one, which is still interesting. Okay. Um, but yeah, like, so I often will make like mood boards and things like that, especially with my friends. Like we'll, we'll save like little collaborative mood boards. Like if we feel like we're going to shoot together, like, cool. um, I don't know, it could be anything from like wardrobe or props or kind of location or just general vibes um and yeah this particular day um I had one of my really good friends Jenny over from New Zealand visiting Bali and we were showing her and a couple of our other friends around um some beautiful spots that Bali has to offer and um I think it was like raining all day like the weather wasn't looking very good uh, but we really wanted to head out to this tree because like I knew that um, there were these ridiculous roots that were super deep and it felt like very maternal and kind of like almost like nativity <laughs> vibes. Yep. Um, and I, I like the whole idea of like a, like a rebirth or something like that, but, um, I didn't, we didn't want it to be like too like spiritual or like freaky. Um, but ultimately we were just having fun and we planned to get out to this tree at, um, blue hour and it was pissing down with rain and we were like oh god like we've driven an hour or two or whatever it was and like it's it's just raining we're not going to be able to get any gear out um but we started chatting to the locals and they actually they were really curious in what we were doing and they said that they would like pray the rain away for us and they all started praying and that they were like okay you have 10 minutes to to get the shot and we were like oh my gosh like thank you like we'll, we'll respect this time um and it, it was more than 10 minutes so like we probably had like 25 minutes half an hour and we were just playing around in the tree 
um, getting a bunch of shots, but it was super rushed. Like we didn't, we couldn't really knuckle down on one concept and these files sat on my computer for months and months because I didn't really know like what to do with it or like how it would fit in context of the other pictures that I'd been taking around that time. Um, and I definitely wanted to focus uh, my energy into creating like a cohesive body of work and like really challenging myself to stick to one color palette um, and having like a progressive theme um, throughout the collection. So yeah, this, this piece like just sat on my hard drive for ages and I started editing um, ones um, with the model and she was like in completely different poses and we were I was playing around with these and I thought they looked quite interesting, but it wasn't really like sparking much. And then I stumbled across this image when I looked at the archive months and months later. Um, and I, it's crazy what like a fresh perspective does. I seen it in a completely new light. Um, so your, you looked at your image from a from few months, months ago. Before. Okay. Yeah. In a completely new way. Like, yeah. um, and I do that often with myself. Like I'll just let it, sit there and brew and if I look at it on a different day like I'll feel a completely different way about it um and then yeah it I took it into the lab the little editing softwares and everything um and once I started um changing the colors around I thought a very different way about it so initially like we'd shot it um we brought artificial lighting in and we had um it was like very red and blue mm -hmm. um, and it felt very like Halloween vibes and kind of masculine and angry. Yeah, it felt angry and it felt um, tacky. And I think that's why like I didn't really like them. But once I started like playing around with the hue and I, I made it feel like a lot more like feminine and light and surreal. Um, and yeah, then I realized like, oh, this actually has a lot of potential. Um, and just in the editing cave, it develops, develops, develops. I love that and then, process. And then boom. Yeah, but it's beautiful. Yeah, it's not it's not a formula by any means. Like it's just so many so many sets of trial and error. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm exactly saying I'm, I'm smiling as you're talking because I'm like, that's me, <laughs> that's me, that's me. I take months between taking a shot and editing it. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm a big believer in. Well, a I'm lazy. So actually, like, if I have a set of however many images, yeah, because I shoot, it's in, I shoot in a project in series, yeah, it's daunting. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm gonna have to start. I'm gonna have to start selections of yeah. a few thousand photos. Oh my gosh! Like, oh god! I'm where, glad where I'm not the start? only one. <laughs> yeah, but I also am a big believer in emotional space. So yeah, you, you take mm -hmm. a shot. You are you are in a specific frame of mind in that yeah. from from inception to kind of that shutter um, button getting pressed. After that, like, sit on it, rest with it, mm -hmm. like, try and forget about it for a bit. Because Do you think there's too much rest that can be done? Yeah, yes. Because <laughs> I'm so guilty of that <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, I couldn't give you an answer as to what <laughs> yeah. the perfect time is, but I, at least some, I know guys that will take a shot, take some shots, edit the same day. The, the same night it's on Instagram that night. Uh, it's, I, I couldn't think of anything wor worse. And do you think... Uh, I don't know if this is like in every case, but I find like a lot of the time in that setting, um, the piece is also only digested for a couple hours or days and then it's out of sight, out of mind. Yep. But like maybe the longer you take to edit it, like the longer lasting impact you want you want it to have or you yeah, believe it's, it's going to have. It. Yeah. Um, but I also think uh, it depends on your intent, what you're going to do with those images. Like, like, I mean, I'm, I want a series to be cohesive. So if I go and edit straight away, I will only edit images if I know I've got a week to, I know to me, but if you, if I know I've got a week to edit all the images, cause then I'm, I, I can be in the same kind of cohesive space. Totally. Otherwise I'm like, if I edit one image one day, I'll go back yeah. uh, a week later, edit, edit another it's image from the same time, and it's just completely. And so you're traveling quite a lot um, yeah. to get your pieces. And so is that maybe part of it too, that you kind of like want to be in your own space rather than being like, oh, I've got to pack all these like cords and hard drives up tomorrow. So I'm not going to be able to get into that flow state. 
Um, no, I just see editing as a separate project almost. Yeah, totally. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to start that project another, uh, you know, another day. Yeah. But also because our projects are travel-based, they're often such amazing experiences. It's like we, mm-hmm. we finish a project and we don't think so much about the photos. All we do is talk about the people we've met. I remember this and that. And, Keep oh, brewing in and it. And it's like, oh, mm. we just, it's, Unfortunately for Fee, my wife, most of our holidays are photography projects. So oh, they're not really like... She does like, well. <laughs> yeah, she, she, well, she, she, the, the odd hotel and beach we, we get, but... Sweet in the deal. Yeah, <laughs> most of the time it's like that is our time off. Yeah. So... Um, but you're obviously like infatuated with these experiences too and the people that you meet. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't imagine you would be doing it. No, absolutely not. Yeah. No. Fee less so. I mean... Uh, I've kind of dragged her along for the ride, mm-hmm. but it depends where we go. If we go somewhere windy, cold and wet, she's not interested. <laughs> uh, but some, sometimes those ty- type of places make amazing series. Anyway, I'm not talking about me, but um, I think one of the things I guess that most people would know about you is is in the crypto world, right? In the NFT, which seems to be like a, still like a separate world altogether that yeah that you have to kind of really have make a deliberate step to get into yeah where did did that start in the hospital bed it was <laughs> like a- um luckily um i think i delved into the space like a month or two prior to the accident um but it was very i was still like navigating it right so i didn't really know like where it was going or like how much time I should be spending there or like it, I was really just kind of like throwing some coins in the thing and seeing what happened, closing my eyes and yeah, right. that was that. But um, yeah, once I'd like been gifted that time uh, to think about everything, like I kind of was just all of a sudden I was all in. Um, because I had nothing else to spend my time on. And I was like, oh, well, I may as well, like, spend my time learning about something new. If I'm if I'm not going to be able to create, like, how could I use the creations that I already have and the assets that I've already spent, like, the last decade building? Like, how could I give them a new life or find a new audience? Um, so, yeah, that was super empowering. But a, a lot of time on the screen as well, yeah. uh, rather than like out there in the field creating yeah. so it's like bittersweet but given the circumstances it was quite ideal when you say dive all in what does that mean for someone who doesn't really know the nft world um i guess it, it can mean whatever you want it to in um in my case i mean like just in terms of like where i was spending my time because i no longer had these client jobs uh to do and i know i was no longer like out shooting so i could spend all it, it's quite a demanding space well not so much anymore but in 2021 it was very demanding with um you know there's like twitter spaces like 24 yeah. 7 like 20 different ones you could choose from to tune in like a chat room and like people would be talking and like asking you to get on stage and share stuff and blah 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 and yeah super demanding for those that don't know what twitter space is do you want to explain it oh no we don't like twitter spaces either do we um yeah i I feel the same way um (laughs) yes twitter spaces are like um they're like live interactive podcasts so um you can you just start a room it's like a chat room and people can join and jump up on stage and you've got like a hundred people in the audience or maybe only three on people stage in the meaning audience. you are a speaker yeah now. on the yep. platform so like you've got like an audience level and then you can like request to speak and the host or co-host will like accept you and you like yep. you can like go up and talk about what it like they would usually be on random like different photography topics or like maybe more like technical topics or like uh teaching people how to like mint their own artworks blah blah blah. there was like everything you could think of under the sun but it was so noisy like you know everyone just like always has an opinion and often it'd be like the loudest person in the room is going to get the attention and that's not necessarily like the always the best way to spend Mm -hmm. your time uh, and that's quietened down a lot now. Um, with a lot of people like not really active anymore. But um, yeah, I I did spend a lot of my time like listening to these things and just kind of like seeing what other people were up to because I didn't know anyone else doing it 
uh, when I first started. Um, there was no one else in New Zealand um, that I knew of at that point doing it. So it was, I was quite like alone. I didn't really have any like friends or anything. But then you start meeting people online yep. and like building friendships and like that kind of stuff. I think collectively was really nice for everybody because everyone was like in lockdown and everyone was missing like a lot of social activity. Everyone had time off work. Um, and like in some ways it was quite beautiful, the conversations that happened because there might not have ever been like another timeline mm. where those people could like all align. Um, and that that environment now is due to, I guess the the uh, the bear market, as we uh, yeah. as people say, is pretty quiet. Do you do yeah. you, are you active still with? Are you yeah. just preparing for the next release? Yeah, I would say um, I'm I'm not necessarily like super vocal uh, <laughs> there, but I'm I'm active every day, and like I I do what okay. I can to. I don't know, contribute value and that's like not in a surface level manner. Um, and you have, you find, you kind of find your tribe and like people that you talk to and bounce ideas off regularly. And I think a lot of things these days like happen in the DMs, like behind right. closed yeah. doors. Um, so you've always kind of got conversations going on, but it's just not necessarily like, Hey, this is my work. Buy my piece, okay. like blah, blah. and it, but it's nice because it's filtered out like a lot of people who had very different intentions than I do. Um, so yeah, yeah it's I, bittersweet. I, I was I was chatting with one of my heroes, Joey L, about this, um, and he called it chemotherapy for oh my for goodness, Twitter. oh my goodness. <laughs> so just yeah. but yeah. You yeah, can get fair rid enough. Of, get rid of some of the get, separate yep. the wheat from the chaff, as we say in, yep. in England. Um, do you find yourself now creating for NFTs, and, and if so, does that change anything? Yeah, it's a really good question, and not like I guess something I'd also want to touch on is like you know people call themselves like NFT artists, and it's like no, <laughs> if you've been creating for so much longer than that, like unless you're actually doing something to do with a technology and like blockchain that's like different to how you made your art before then mm -hmm. no you're really just an artist like using that as a medium to um yeah like as a new audience like i don't think musicians like started calling themselves like mp3 yeah. artists when <laughs> itunes or spotify or before nfts out. when you just hung your artwork in galleries you did call yourself a gallery artist exactly um and so i find it I find the label quite frustrating, obviously, because there's like still a very negative like connotation with the whole space, and like they definitely are Is like that... I don't know, maybe from I'm him? just maybe I'm just self conscious um, from people about who don't understand it. Or yeah, what? from people who don't understand it, and I can see why. Like there definitely is like scammy like Ponzi behavior that happens, yep. but it's like it's so different and far everything. removed. I agree, I agree, yeah. and it's so different and like far removed from like the the area that i've landed upon um but yeah anyway I can't, what was the question no, i, I totally know. got I don't know. Was the oh you said um you said how has it changed my, does it change my, has yeah, it affected like my process or whatever um and so yeah it it was quite daunting because, like I said, I, I started NFTs when I couldn't create any work and I would, a lot of the work that I sold initially was, well, yeah, all of it was like my archive of things that I'd created in the past. And obviously all of those pieces were made without even knowing that like any sort of monetary value would be attached to them. They were all just like random passion things that I'd done with my friends um, or out having a good time. And so, yeah, kind of when I, once I rehabilitated from all my injuries and I could go back out uh into the field it was kind of like oh goodness like people like <laughs> people are like expecting something of me now and like pressure like, yeah pressure pressure um so that was really scary to begin with but I think ultimately if the space like fizzled and crashed like I, I'm still going to be producing the same work that I am now and in hindsight when I look at the three collections that I put out um post recovery 
all of them have been like very introspective and all of them I've kept like uh, very personal and like I haven't shared or like teased the idea with people like before I released it. So like I think, yeah, like back in the Instagram days, you know, you'd post a photo and you would like trying to gauge how many people liked it and blah, blah, blah. But like with these things, I'm like, no, like this is like authentically what I want to put out and it kind of taught me to really slow down the process instead of getting excited about an image and sharing it straight away like keeping it and like letting it brew and coming back to it um and like putting it out with intention like alongside a whole body or like a whole study of work love it yeah always Um, have to have intent behind Put it. Do you ever get nervous when you put photos out there? Even on yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, th- yeah. Then there's the flip side of it. It's like okay, well, like no one has validated me about this, <laughs> and now I'm putting it. I'm like minting it for eternity on the blockchain, and like, what if it's not received well or something? But I, I don't know. I don't really care too much about it. I think as long as I like it, that's all that I care about. Do you have, have a, any relationship with the with the people that have collected your artwork? Is it, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, like That's half, a nice half. thing about the, it's really lovely, yeah. and like, um, I've been able to connect with like people completely outside of my field that I would never really run into anyway. Like, you know, becoming good friends with like scientists and like doctors and like people who can like teach you about other walks of life, and they're like equally as interested in you and you you feel like that's a really weird feeling because you're like why would you care about this random jpeg but um yeah you like get to know people like yeah it's it's really beautiful and you've obviously done a lot of exhibitions or been featured in exhibitions Mm -hmm. how has that come off the back of nft success or is that yeah exactly so um oh i i have participated in a few group exhibitions um prior to all this but um nfts allowed me i think i've been exhibited like 10 times in the past year like just through nfts which is like something that was never possible to me before that um and maybe i wasn't really like seeking it out as much or like putting my attention there uh but I i think that's super incredible it's amazing um, because especially in like it's meant to be a digital space right but all these things were like real life events where there were like people there like standing like physically like being able to touch Looking your stuff screen. yeah and unfortunately i haven't been able to attend any um i'd really like to next year but um i i attended one in new zealand but that was like super small <laughs> 10 in the last year amazing good for you that's yeah um that is incredible what advice could you give to others who want me included who want to kind of navigate that nft space at maybe um maybe now's a good time while it's quiet and Mm. not much going on but how how can you how can someone kind of do it right Uh, or is there such a way as doing it right yeah i'm like i still feel like i don't even know how to do it and i've it's been like two and a half years um and I still don't really know if I I don't I don't think I do do it right though either because there are like it is very like clicky kind of space and keep hearing that yeah um I don't yeah like you said before I don't really always follow the rules and I I don't know I'm I'm probably not a very good person to ask for advice but um yeah it is a lot quieter now and perhaps that is a good thing because like people are more receptive to like new and interesting work not just like the same cookie cutter stuff um but I would say yeah like probably finding some sort of like gallery or curator who is already like interested in those themes you know they're already going to have like an audience of people um who are into that kind of thing because if you if you just jump if you just jump in the ocean like you don't really know what you're going to get but maybe if you yeah like connect with some sort of curator would you put, already... still put a lot of time into because i see it in kind of two ways that that method um on and just kind of hit and hope almost mm. um or spending time in spaces or building a twitter following and building connections that way and then finding the right to you know when you do that that could take 
you know, what is the right amount of an audience, but build yeah. an audience mm -hmm. so that there might be some people interested in your work and then drop. I think, yeah, definitely. People like, I think a lot of people invest in the person more so than the piece. Right. Um, and if no one knows who you are, then you've got kind of no chance. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, definitely you want to establish yourself before you before you meant something yeah. but i mean maybe people have had success otherwise and a lot of people also like enjoy the idea of the provenance and like you know the time stamp on a piece um, right. and using that like especially as like documentary purposes maybe that's really important to like mint something on a certain day um but yeah my general advice would definitely be to um yeah, maybe jump in some Twitter spaces. I haven't had the time to like listen to those so much anymore, so I don't know how much value like still gets shared there, but I still see them all the time and yeah, I'm sure still, things yeah. are happening. Um even if it's just your name, your your profile being in that group, people Yeah, oh you can start knowing such You can just you. sit in a yeah. room and people start recognizing you and like just tapping on, you know, they're just tapping through and yeah. checking out your profile and yeah. stuff. Um and yeah, I suppose the best thing to do would be like find people that you admire and like start interacting with them on the timeline, like commenting under uh, tweets that Why they make. Why aren't you answering my fucking <laughs> messages? <laughs> um, but I don't, I'm not very good at, I, that sort of stuff doesn't come naturally to me. And no, I think I'm either. really lucky that I started early because I don't, I don't know how well I would do like, yeah. What's the next early out, thing yeah. in photography that we we need to get into i know <laughs> yeah i miss mm. the nft AI. bubble <laughs> i miss the instagram thing i was so against instagram for years now i'm just yeah. catching up ai i mean photographers how do we use ai to to improve make money to mm -hmm. do whatever we want i mean the, I'll, I'll ask I'll, I'll give you the opportunity in a minute but i just see i see the ai um wave should we say mm -hmm. at the moment as purely for photographers um not necessarily a threat but just a way to make your process more efficient yeah and to help with maybe getting jobs to help with just daily tasks and that kind of thing editing i mean look at what Lightroom and Photoshop can do now. Yeah. It's ridiculous and updates keep coming every month, I every know. few months. It's yeah, insane. well, that's something um, that I've been thinking about a lot because obviously like it's such a sensitive topic and especially like within the digital art space, um, people are like, they want you to be very transparent about when AI has been used. And I can understand like people want don't want to be like, sold a lie <laughs> um but yeah for me it's like pe we've been using content aware and clone stamping on yeah. photoshop for years so like where do we draw the line photoshop itself is, is ai exactly whether um, you use content aware or not or whatever you know it's like any yeah. adjustment you do yeah it's artificially yeah. intelligent um and that's great and like we benefit from that and yeah, it's just, I find it hard, like, at, at what point are we going to label it otherwise? Um, because, like, one of my favorite features that have come out recently is the uh, denoise on Lightroom. I don't okay. know if you've tried that yet. Yeah, I didn't like it. You didn't like Why not? Well, because I come, I use Topaz denoise. Oh, okay. And that is, when used in Photoshop, it's just a, a layer. Yeah. So, and I love layers. And, yeah. um, you know, once you have a layer, you can do whatever you want with it. Oh, so but it locks it in on Lightroom and yeah. then, yeah, yeah. okay. It's, yeah. it's just totally a bit more it. clunky for me. Yeah. I think it will come, but yeah. the biggest problem with Lightroom, that's why there's Photoshop, is there's no layers. There's no, yeah. you know, there's it's um, it's all integrated, right? So yeah. the same with the denoise. But it's still, I did try it. It is amazing at what it does. Yeah, well, I think in terms of like a free spot, sorry, it's not free, but um, yep. in terms of like a software yep. that like you already have installed on your computer instead of having to like yep. go and buy a subscription for whatever, it's super incredible what it does. And I also, when I was playing around on Photoshop the other day, I saw it, there's like Photoshop denoise and it looks pretty similar, Is like that? a new AI denoise. Oh, I didn't see that. Um, 
And I don't know if it's just like the same thing I as can't Lightroom. Keep up with all of it, I know there's so Honestly, much. No. Maybe it could have even been in like the beta one. I, I don't know. But um, just with the denoise in general, no matter what um, application that's used on, that has changed the way that I shoot completely because now that I've been like more restricted with the gear that I can bring and like not always like being able to have my tripod in crazy little tight corners and blah, blah, blah. Um, I've noticed with the denoise, I can reduce my shutter speed um, and do a lot more things handheld and then just bring back the light that way rather than having a long exposure all the time. And so that's something that's like directly influence my flow on the field um but does that mean like i'm an ai artist now i don't know, well, you know? i'm exactly the same it's funny you talked yeah. talk like that because after i got topaz um i was like oh i can get away with more yeah and i, I felt guilty about it i was it's like, like a safety net kinda. yeah yeah like, oh, i know i can i know i know i can recover that yeah but now i can get but a we better, do feel, better why faster do we shot. feel guilty we shouldn't feel know. guilty about because it because at some point you're not going to have to do anything. I know. I think that's, so where do we draw uh, the line? I don't know. We're all fucked. Yeah, um, yeah AI uh, AI is... Do you know, I, I ask this question with every guest because it's the hot topic, but... Yeah. Um, not this question I'm going to ask, just the question of AI. Mm -hmm. um, and I just are kind of not bored of talking about it, but uh, it is it is what it is. And we, you know, if if you don't work and live with it, and evolve I think with so. it but your your not style but your um what shall i say your art is mm. i feel more conducive to the use of ai or more more in danger of ai yeah and if you think about surrealism and that type of photography i mean yeah there are some amazing AI artist mm -hmm. even now doing some incredible like incredible surreal yeah image work it's not photography it's completely different but it's digital art mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it um do you are you a little bit fearful of that that yeah a little bit um and I think like if you asked me this question last year I'd be like no not at all definitely not like art is the only thing that will survive um Whereas this year, I'm like, okay, well, I've been completely proven wrong. But I think for me, ultimately, like, I'm not going to get the same enjoyment out of, like, sitting behind a screen uh, making my work. Like, I, so much of the process, like, is outdoors, location okay. scouting on the scene. So, like, taking that away uh, would, like, be taking away, like, a lot of the essence. Um, and sure, I think... Yeah, maybe I could make some nice things in AI, but I'm not going to be as fulfilled that way. But I, I do believe in using it as a tool. Um, I'm just, yeah, maybe slightly concerned about where we draw that line um, and, like, how we have to label things. Yeah, I think you mentioned something there about fulfillment. And mm -hmm. what does what does fulfillment and or success mean to you? How would you define that for yourself? Um, so many layers to it. Um, and I think the only way I could maybe define it is like what I feel like I'm missing right now. And, um, yeah, I think that goes back to finding other people that like you can like share that fulfillment with. Like, I think fulfillment is a lot better shared. Um, and kind of like being on like quite a lonesome journey over the past couple years and like being inside so much and so much computer time I think it would be really nice to like find some sort of like collective passion with other people where like they can fill in gaps I can fill in gaps and we both feel like that's like a mutual exchange and if that's kind of going to compound and quantitate quantify from there um I, and I think that is very successful, no matter what it is. For what purpose? For, yeah, and that purpose could be one of so many things. Um, and I, I think it evolves for me, like every season that I go through in my life, like that purpose is kind of like floating around, and I'm always trying to like catch it. And I, I think that's okay. I don't think it needs to stay the same the whole time. Um, but it is important to like be within reach of it and how big a part of that is philanthropic endeavors 
Um, a lot. I think that's been quite like consistent throughout my work, minus maybe the past year where I, I felt like I've been a lot more selfish and introspective and um, like philosophical towards my artwork. But something that I really like want to get back uh, into my work would be yeah like tying in like a philanthropic purpose um and i see a big uh gateway there with the nft space as well with the amount of um spare money people have to throw around like we should be using this for things far greater than like i don't know buying new camera gear or something i mean that that is great um but the amount of money that's been thrown around like why don't we actually make impact uh but it's hard to find people who like care about these things as much as I do. Um, so I haven't haven't quite got there yet. I think it's lovely to hear you say that because um, in our middle age, actually, no, that's not true. Throughout our thirties, our I say our me and fee, mm. our priorities start started shifting and. As we became a little bit more educated, traveled more, or a bit more wise about just general state of the world, out of more nuances and insights with regards to how people work, the politics of everything, um, mm. how systems, society becomes so disturbed, and what people's real priorities are status, ego, money, materials. So when you say something like that, I I would say that's pretty much the same with any industry, any form of life. Right. It's so difficult to find people that actually not only care, but actually want to get off their ass and actually yeah. do something about it. Whatever that is, whether it's whether it is selling artwork and reaping those rewards and then giving it back, whether it's education platforms, whether it's physically volunteering with something, giving back your mm. time and your energy, whatever it is, um, I've I've come close to many billionaires and be seen, had insights into that Uh world. And it's not only sad, but very scary about what drives them, right? They're billionaires for a reason. (laughs) Terrifying. They're rich for a reason. Yeah. They're rich because they're driven by greed, essentially. Mm -hmm. And, you know, might get loads of comments about this, but I'm generalizing very much so. And I was one of those persons, well, I wasn't a billionaire. But <laughs> when I started earning money at, at a young age, that was me. I was like, I want to have a nice car. I want to have a, yeah. a good house. I want to have the best cameras. I want to have this and that. Yeah. And um, quickly realized that doesn't fulfill me. And, yeah. and nor it does anyone, I would I would guess. So yeah, I, I totally agree that it's very, very difficult mm. to find those people. And it's sad to hear that kind of that, that NFT space is the same. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure there are people out there and there are like, you know, a handful of people doing some really lovely things. Um, but it, yeah, it's reassuring to like be reminded that it's, it's not just that space. Like it is in some way like human nature. Um, but yeah, it, it's a shame because there, there's a lot of people like throwing so, like just huge sums of money around and all I can think about is like this could be directed yeah. into like something something crazy um such as what some causes that are close to your heart um well I guess like things that I've worked on in the past have like been like deeply tied to the ocean yeah um so like there's obviously like coral restoration and then, um, you know, like endangered species and then social work. And then after like my accident and everything, something that I've been meaning to kind of like tie into my work somehow. And I haven't found the right way to do it, but I really want to like somehow acknowledge, um, or pay tribute to like the medical system, uh, because I really had no idea how, any of that stuff worked. Like I had, you know, the odd friend who'd like trained as a nurse um, and that kind of thing. But I I never fully understood the extent of like even the psychological side that it takes to like embark on a job like that and do that every day and like turn up every day, like nothing happened yesterday and just like keep going on with that. And like 
like rescue services and like the helicopters that go out and search for people like uh, that that was all stuff that never really crossed my mind that these people might need extra resources um or like yeah deserve more tribute so I, that's something I'm I'm still playing like with the idea of how I could tie that in but I, I don't really know how yet well if you think of it let me know I'd love to be a part of it but what yeah we'll do. um what's the solution to improving that that whole development of people want you know wanting people to care or being able to give more resources to those which is sad mm. that these types of areas need more resources you it, it's just flipped isn't it it's just the wrong way yeah. around is is education a big part of that or awareness is that where we as photographers can help yeah I think so. I think so maybe awareness because even if I think of myself like I just wasn't aware of these things yeah. until I was directly in that yeah you can't position. blame people for that yeah and I th- yeah, when I think about that as well, it's like I don't think you can really tell people what to care about either. I, but I do think like you could show them, or like you know you can like reel them in, like let them smell something, and then they like figure it out for themselves. But I don't think people like being like told what to care about, uh, and that's like you know with a lot of charity work when things are just kind of like slammed in people's faces, people just turn a blind eye to it, and like you're not really getting through to anybody. Um, but yeah, that is what's really powerful about art is that, um, yeah, like you could kind of like hide little nuggets of of these topics like into your work and like maybe people find them, maybe people don't, but uh, if they give you enough time of day and you do get to have a discussion over it, then yeah, maybe you've done your job. Absolutely, yeah. Hopefully, maybe. No, I think maybe it's it. your surface level, I don't know. I think you nailed it on the head. I. I we find it very difficult still to reconcile why people don't care about a lot of things. Oceans, mm. for example, we're, we're huge um, advocates of ocean conservation and um, we don't do it nearly enough as we can, could. But yeah. we, you know, you end up getting torn in, I want to help that, I want to help that, I want to help that. Of so course. you end up giving one penny to each and it doesn't really... Totally. You kind of have to go, right, I'm going to choose. You'd go all this is in our- on one. And then that can be daunting as well because maybe you're like, well, why is this the issue that I've chosen? There's all these other issues Well, that's that my question. Why, why, yeah. why certain something? And that's probably why people don't like being preached to because yeah. like, well, I don't care but, about that, but I care more about this. Yeah. Like, and it, why? It kind of like becomes part of your identity as well. And I... I think I got um, kind of like engulfed in that for like a certain period of my life where like I really just wanted to like give back and like be like, okay, I have these skills. How could they be valuable for other people? And it it didn't even really matter where it was. I just kind of enjoyed the fact that I could help somewhere like that filled my cup. Um, But then, yeah, you can't, you get tied into projects. um, And at some point, like yeah you begin like advocating for these things and like that's great but some people might like attach that to your whole identity and you're like oh that's just like one one thing that I care yeah. about but like yeah. it's not like a be all end all um why do you why do you think people don't care about I mean I'm thinking not specifically about certain stuff well maybe I am I mean uh, I can put it into an example like if you're we we like to scuba dive and if we go diving wherever mm-hmm. most of the time you'll see other people diving yeah and most of the time those other people diving won't give a shit about touching coral f- uh, finning a manta ray away yeah or you know just leaving trash on the beach yeah or just throwing trash over the side of a boat like yeah. i so for me i just don't understand that yeah like so i can't reconcile this huge barrier between me and them and I and it just turns into anger and hate which no one was mm. filled with and then that kind of fuels the wrong method of trying to give back it's like well, no, yeah it's I like well why with... would I give back when people are just gonna yeah. counteract it all anyway yeah. and but I don't understand why I never understand why people like if you threw any good cause out there to me I'd go well I, I yeah I don't support it yeah in terms of financially yeah. or for, you know i don't Not give anything I, to it but yeah. i understand why people like that's yeah. a cause worth fighting for yeah. most of the time mm-hmm. right and i think 
something I found in the sustainability space as well is um, like the competitiveness <laughs> between different causes. Like some people, you know, they've got their thing. Maybe it's like plastic and someone else has their thing. Really? And, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, well, like my issue is more important than that. Therefore, like, let's not waste time on that. We need to think about this. And it's like, I found that so overwhelming because like people were just very dismissive of like even really small things that people just like genuinely trying to help and like genuinely like maybe they've like just found their purpose and they feel fulfilled by this and they're just shut down because like oh it's not like a it doesn't matter in the grand scheme mm -hmm. um and yeah that that was pretty deflating yeah yeah and the whole thing is kind of deflating yeah <laughs> anyway sigh <laughs> All we can do is what we can do, right? And mm -hmm. my mum always used to say that. She still does say that. Like, you can only do your part, um, but make sure you yeah. do it, right? And yeah. If, if we all you, did then... it, the world would be a better place. Yeah. And you just have to, I guess, kind of live or learn to live with the fact that human nature is not going to change for the, yeah. you know, the general gist of it. And there's always going to be people mm -hmm. like that. There'll always be people for it, yeah. and you just kind of have to find your place. And you're never gonna be able to like solve world hunger. You no. know that these these things no. are so. Although ironically, the billionaires can't. Like uh, that. Yeah. Isn't that weird to think about? Like it's frustrating. It's so weird. You could solve world hunger like that if they wanted to. What? Yeah. It's just weird. Anyway. It, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm on the same page. So uh, on this podcast, we have a tradition where we get the guests to write a question for the next guest, not knowing who they are. Uh -huh. Okay, so someone, uh, one of our previous guests wrote a question for not knowing it was you turning up. But if I ask you that question mm -hmm. and put you on the spot, I'm interested to, to hear your answer. The question being, um, what are the failures in your life that you would consider a failure? that you mm. cherish the most? Um, I feel like I'm constantly failing and constantly learning, constantly evolving and shape-shifting, and I love that, and I think I, I welcome that into my life, to be honest, as confronting as it can be. Um, but, like, maybe one of the biggest things that, like, I have been devastated about in the past is, like, losing a camera or like deleting an SD card or like something getting corrupted. Oh my God. Um, we can all relate to that yeah. worst nightmare. Right. Um, and it's happened to me. So like not the same thing happening every time, but I've had so many lost cameras and corrupted cards and like me just like personally delete, like accidentally <laughs> formatting things that shouldn't be formatted oh, and God. I think that's the worst feeling because you're like I can't even blame anyone like it's literally myself um so you cherish those failures because no you... I, oh, I I don't know if I can say cherish them but um they definitely like taught me so much to live in the moment than like chasing things that are just like perishable with my camera and like living those experiences through a lens because that stuff is, you know, you capture a photo and you think you've captured it and you've got it, but like, no, you don't necessarily. It's just some random files sitting like non tangibly on your computer, but like, you know, experiencing that through your own eyes and like, I don't, yeah, experiencing it with the other people around you that rather than like living it through the lens. Um, the more that it's happened to me, the more that I've realized it's not really. It's not about chasing those moments for me. I'd rather kind of like curate a scene uh, and plan it meticulously and then go and shoot it than like try to capture the fleeting stuff all the time. Um, and I think that's been really nice for me because I'm not um, I'm not caught up like babysitting my gear and stuff anymore trying to chase these things. So I think for my lifestyle, it's been like a nice progression to like learn through all those like very awful moments where you've lost your life's best work over the click of a button. But yeah, we try and take the positive side. What a wonderful <laughs> answer and what a wonderful way to, to end the podcast. And I, I totally get where you're coming from. I wish I was as strong as you and I wish I was, I could, 
be able to just let that Detect. go, at least learn from it and just... But It's uh, easier if, said than felt. If more people can enjoy being in the moment, mm. enjoying the experience with whatever you are doing at that time, then mm. we would have a better world to live in. But for this, I've enjoyed every moment of it. And thank, thank you so you. much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Been a very good conversationalist. It's been <laughs> wonderful, and and hopefully we'll have plenty more. Yeah. Um, but until then, where can people find you? Where can people look at your work? Um, I don't know what people's plat- platform Name preferences. Them all. Um, but yeah, Gabriella Morton is on Instagram, Twitter. I'm Gabriella Mort because I couldn't get the last two letters it frustrates me so bad um but yeah ma- mainly just gabriella morton okay is all usually we'll put it handle. in the description anyway, yeah <laughs> thank you so much it's been absolutely amazing until next time Alrighty. see you later see ya <laughs>